Welcome to the online lecture on O'Connor's Revelation. Uh, we're going to try to make sure, let me move my little face out of the way here. Um, well, where can I put myself? Here we go. Sorry about that. I'm um, going to try to uh, do this in one uh, video, so I'll move quickly, but hopefully our online discussion will be able to uh, explore some of these questions a little bit further. First thing I want to start off with, it seems almost that it's de rigueur to have to, to, to do this, but um, the fact of the matter is that the, the sh story contains a number of racial epithets, terms, attitudes towards race that a lot of people would find very offensive, and naturally so. Uh, I won't defend the use of those terms, but I will defend them in the in the cause of art, um, because quite simply, if you're an artist, if you're a writer, a musician, if you're a sculptor, a filmmaker, and you want to depict people who have uh, racially offensive attitudes, um, you really have to depict them the way they actually talk. And so um, I think it's kind of a, a given that that you have to depict a racist as a racist, an anti-Semite as an anti-Semite. I mean, what what would we think if we saw a, 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 a film on World War II and the Nazis and they were not saying anything bad about Jews? I mean, it wouldn't be quite authentic, would it? So um, understand that, that the author is not necessarily endorsing that sort of language. She's trying to depict them as they are. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is, is the plot line, because it, you, you see this plot line quite frequently in O'Connor's works, and we saw it certainly uh, with good country people, that uh, the, the, the story starts off with sort of a status quo, a static kind of um, non-eventful environment, and then somehow a crisis uh, emerges, there's some sort of violent action uh, or disturbing action, and then a revelation is, is made, is laid bare, um, but that the story ends with a lot of open questions. You see that again in this one called Revelation. Um, and so be, be on the lookout for that sort of, sort of thing. Um, there are several themes and threads that I want to kind of explore here. Uh, the first one would be the problem of self-perception. If the short story is about anything, it's about the problem that we have as individuals trying to distinguish between who we think we are and who we really are. And you certainly see this all through the story. It becomes apparent, more and more apparent, as Ruby Turpin sort of talks and reveals more about her attitudes, her ideas, her thinking, especially when we find out more about how she feels about other people, that there's a big disconnect between who she thinks she is and who she really is in terms of a, um, sort of her moral standing, especially. And, um, and, and, and that's, that's indicative of everything. She's a, she's the kind of person who is, um, sort of desperately wants to put forward a view of herself as being respectable, as being, you know, the, the, the kind of people that the whole community really, if it weren't for us, if it weren't for Claude and me, and notice how she puts herself first, Claude and me, Claude and I, um, uh, me and Claude, that is, I should say, um, that, um, she, she, uh, she, she, she has this view that if it weren't for people like her, all of society would break down, that they, they have this burden of being the responsible people. Uh, we are the builders of things. We are the makers of things. We are the holders of, of the standard of taste and decency and everybody else. Why, if we weren't for us, they would all go to rack and ruin. Um, so that's a pretty self-important spot she puts herself in. She's a small farmer, uh, owns therefore a small business. And they, they, uh, but their pigs are different from other people's pigs. There's some pigs on concrete over there to the right. Their pigs are different, right? They, they have clean, respectable, decent middle class pigs, uh, not like dirty people's pigs with that are also dirty. Um, so there's this perception of herself, and that's what is built on this edifice of really shaky timber, if you will, and that's going to come crashing down. And we're not going to be told how she works through this. That's O'Connor's not going to let you know that. She's going to let you know that that um, that she's got a revelation coming. What she does with it is her own business. Um, and so uh, a lot of this is, uh, you know, this, this sort of problem with self-perception reveals itself with this character and with other characters in Flannery O'Connor texts, and that is that they're constantly using cliches and and you should you should think about this as well 
what do cliches reveal about a speaker? It reveals, in my view, that the speaker isn't a very original thinker, um, that they take what they're given as conventional wisdom and apply it in their lives, but they never challenge anything. They never think about anything. Well, is a bird in the hand really worth two in the bush? I don't know. To me, I think, depends on what kind of bird it is. Um, and sometimes, um, and sometimes maybe the other cliche, nothing ventured, nothing gained, is the way to go about it, right? Who wants to hang on to one bird when what you really need is a couple of them? Um, and so, so the cliched, cliches themselves reveal a very narrow sort of way of thinking about the world. Somebody who doesn't question anything. Somebody who never questions the social order. And as somebody who was a was a big believer in civil rights and the civil rights movement, O'Connor was someone who resented, uh, especially older people, older female figures, by the way, who seemed to be so cocky and self-assured that they had the whole world figured out. It's all in the palm of their hand, to use another cliche. And and they walk around spitting out cliches rather than really rethinking the way they were brought up and, and whatnot. Um, you know, you get a lot of people who um, who have these, you know, attitudes and beliefs that they just inherited. They don't really even think about anything. And so that's brought into the, the thing as well. The setting of the story, of course, is the doctor's office. And it it, it proves to be a really wonderful little laboratory because the one thing about doctor's offices is just about everybody has to go to one every now and then. And that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what race or, or what, um, social class you are or what language you speak. It's the kind of place where, you know, even during segregation, uh, depending on where you lived, you were likely to run into all kinds of different people. So she's got this wonderful self-contained box. The waiting room of the doctor's office is like a box where she can introduce people and in inject people and have them do stuff and say stuff and then leave or whatever. Okay. Um, what happens, therefore, when everybody is brought together, no matter who they are? Well, they start bumping into each other, if you will. There's the stylish lady, and the stylish lady and Ruby strike up a conversation, and then, you know, a little wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Oh, look at these le lesser people here. Oh, gosh, we have to tolerate them. Oh, dear. You know, help them you you must, but help them you can't, right? That cliche. Um, we are the responsible, clean, decent folks, and so we have to be tolerate all these dirty people that are beneath us and and um, and the conversation goes on of course the stylish lady's daughter mary grace is just absolutely fuming over this okay so you have the other the other character type that o'connor's fond of and that is the younger singularly unattractive intellectual misunderstood angry female okay um and getting a college education and uh, looks down on her parents so don't don't be fooled it's not that that o'connor is sympathetic with that type of character it's just that that type of character becomes sort of a catalyst in some cases or the recipient of the violence and the revelation. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other, but that character is always sort of in there doing something, bringing something about. In this case, she <laughs> throws a book at Ruby Turpin. By the way, interesting, the title of the book, right? Did you catch that? Um, and hits her upside the head with it, literally throws the book at her, right? There's a cliche. That's an interesting thing. It's an unsaid cliche, throwing the book at her, and grabs her, chokes her, tells her to go back to hell where she came from, you warthog. Um, you, it was just, just, Ruby's just absolutely appalled. Uh, poor Claude's uh, foot uh, or leg is already hurt and he gets it hurt even further. Claude's not too bright. Um, and you get the white trash lady who, you know, dips snuff. I've got your token white trash lady down at the bottom there. Uh, that lady's actually in the, the bottom of the screen is actually fairly famous for her kind of semi-racist diatribe on, on the internet. Anyway, whatever. Um, and over a, a, above that is not the home of a white trash racist. That's, uh, O'Connor's home in Milledgeville. Um, but um, what we see in different different places um, is Ruby's thinking, her mentality. Let's take a look at page 730 where we see a, a lengthy discussion here um, where she's judging people. A lank-faced woman who was certainly the child's mother. She had on a yellow uh, sweatshirt. She doesn't seem to like yellow very much. And wine-colored slacks, both gritty-looking, and the rims of her lips were stained with snuff. 
Her dirty yellow hair was tied behind with a little piece of red paper ribbon. Worse than niggers any day, Mrs. Turpin thought. Right? Why does she, why does she feel that this so-called white trash lady is worse than African American people? Why? Why does she feel that way? Could it be because she's embarrassed that another white person would behave so badly? That she feels white? It, it defies her classification, her ranking, her hierarchy in her mind, just as the African-American dentist who shouldn't be that successful. He shouldn't be up on top. He should be down below where he belongs, right? So you get this revelation here of her thinking. We get revealed to us, her thinking. The gospel hymn was playing, When I looked up and he looked down, Mrs. Turpin, who, who knew it, supplied the last line mentally, And one of these days, I know we, I'll wear a crown. Hmm... Don't know about that, Ruby. Might want to think that through. Anyway, she's, it goes on and she sizes people up by their shoes, right? It's like, hmm, there's that shoe type person and that shoe type person and so on. Sometimes at night when she couldn't get to sleep, Mrs. Turbin would occupy herself with the question of who she was, who she would have chosen to be if she couldn't have been herself. If Jesus had said to her before he came to her, there's only two places available for you. You can either be a nigger or white trash. What would she have said? Please, Jesus, please, she would have said, just let me wait until there's another place available. He would say, no, you have to go now. And I have only those two places, so make up your mind. She would have wiggled and squirmed and begged and pleaded, but it would have been no use and finally she would have said, all right, then make me a nigger. But then, can you imagine a world in which Jesus would use that word? Okay. What kind of bizarre twisted notion, right? And as, as though, <laughs> as though the Prince of Peace would give you this bizarre choice based on some sort of racist uh, uh, classification, uh, make me one then, but that don't mean a trashy one. And, and he would have made her a neat, clean, respectable Negro woman herself, but black. Right. I mean, just the to get inside of her head and think, my Lord, this is the most psychotically warped woman I've ever seen in my life. But we're given an opportunity to to get inside her head and see what she thinks. And boy, it is a revelation for us. Um, sometimes Mrs. Turpin occupied herself at night naming the classes of people. Who does that? I guess the same person who thinks that Jesus uses racist words, I guess. I don't know. On the bottom of the heap were most colored people, not the kind she would have been if she'd been one. No, no, no. If I were black, I'd be different. Um, but most of them. Then next to them, not above, just away from, were the white trash. Notice she doesn't think white trash people are better than African Americans. They're about, about the same, but we got to keep them separate, right? Segregation, after all. Um, then next to them, not above, were, were the white trash. Then, then above them were the homeowners and above them, the home and landowners to which she and Claude belonged, right? She comes before Claude. Above she and Claude, right? She puts herself ahead of Claude, were people with a lot of money and much bigger houses and much more land. But here the complexity of it begin to bear in on her. For some of the people with a lot of money were common and ought to be below she and Claude. And some of the people who had good blood had lost their money and had to rent. And then there were colored people who owned their homes and land as well. There was a colored dentist in town who had two red Lincolns and a swimming pool and a farm with registered white-faced cattle on it. Huh. Usually, by the time she had fallen asleep, all the classes of people were moiling and roiling around in her head, and she would dream they were all crammed in together in a boxcar, being ridden off to be put in a gas oven. Uh, excuse me? <laughs> She's like, I don't know, I'm sleepy. I just put them in a gas oven. Holy smokities! What does that tell, tell you? Well... What is the final outcome of this type of thinking? If it doesn't give you visions of Nazis and genocide, I don't know what would. And that's exactly what I think O'Connor is trying to tell you. Look, it, it, it may seem harmless that these people just think this way, and they just think this way because other people thought this way and handed down this way of thinking to them and their generation. But frankly, it's disturbing, frightening, and it's what causes horrible atrocities. And so you may look at Ruby and say, oh, she's just this plump, older white lady who's kind of uppity. Well, okay, but left to its own devices, these kinds of ways of thinking can lead to some very, very serious consequences. Uh, hence the reference there to the dead gum holocaust. Um, so, so we go on and we finally see that um, 
this kind of segregation, we see it both before and afterwards that Ruby certainly believes in that's based on this false notion of, of, of an appropriate hierarchy of races and classes and, and these kinds of things. They create these false relationships, both before and after the, the book incident. Uh, Ruby has just phony, phony relationships with African American people, people who work for her. And they flatter her because they know they have to, and she's nice to them even though she really doesn't like them. And it's just all a bunch of phoniness. It's sham. It's not people really getting to know each other. It's just people flattering each other and going through an act and being fake. And it, it's shallow. It's superficial. You're not getting to know other people. And most importantly, you're not getting to know other souls. And so you're cutting yourself off from a source of knowledge of other human beings and their experiences. It's limiting. And therefore, you live in a world filled with cliches because you've limited yourself to who you get to really, really know. And so if all you want to do is stay within this narrow slice of people, because of your preconceived racist or, or classist or even sexist ideas, you're never going to get to know all types of people with different experiences, and, and you're never going to learn from them. And so she doesn't. And, and, and th this, this idea is, is beginning to, to sort of worm itself into her head. The crisis comes at her most self-satisfied moment. On 737, um, you see that she says, if it's one thing I am, Mrs. Turpin said with feeling, it's grateful. When I think who all I could have been besides myself and what I got, a little of everything and a good disposition besides, I just feel like shouting, thank you, Jesus, for making everything the way it is. It could have been different for one thing someone else could have got clawed. Oh, dear. Um, at the thought of this, she was flooded with gratitude, and a terrible pang of joy ran through her. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Jesus, thank you, she cried aloud. The book struck her directly over the left eye. It struck almost at the same instant that she realized the girl was about to hurl it. Before she could utter a sound, the raw face came crashing across the table, at toward her, howling. The girl's fingers sank like clamps into the soft flesh of her neck. She heard her mother cry out and Claude shout, Whoa! There, there was an instant when she was certain that she was about to be uh, in an earthquake. Right? Thank you, Jesus, Jesus, thank you. And then the book struck her directly over the left eye. Right? So Mary Grace clobbers her with the book. She's had enough. At the very moment when Ruby is so convinced of her own piety, of her own goodness, of her own, oh, I'm so grateful. Thank you for making the world exactly as it is. That is the most selfish thing you could possibly say, right? As though God made the world and therefore everything in it is entirely his. We have no responsibility for injustice, right? Of course we do. You know, just because things are the way they are doesn't mean that's, that's, that's how God necessarily made them. We have something to do with it, right? We have something to do with the kind of society we live in. And so the self-righteous, self-satisfied attitude of everything's the way it is and it's great because I'm doing well. Well, what about other people? Well, I guess that's just the way God made it. Well, maybe he made it in a way so that you could help. Maybe he could, maybe he made you so you could make it better. But it never occurs to Ruby that she has any responsibility for the injustices in the world because she doesn't think there are any. She doesn't think there are any. And so that, that, that anger at God that she feels afterward is sincere. There's no question about it. The one thing I will say is that if you look at the character, however insincere she frequently is, one thing that is sincere, she's mad at God. There's no question. She really genuinely is. She wants to know, how could you create the world this way? How could, you, how could I be me and be a warthog from hell at the same time? Well, the answer is, look at the pigs. They're metaphors, right? They're a metaphor for us. For people, there's no such thing as a better pig. They're all pretty much pigs, okay? They all have their problems. They're all kind of selfish, right? I mean, we, we when we say somebody's being a pig, what are we saying? They're being selfish. They're, you know, and we say they're, they're, he's hogging, right? It doesn't matter if you put them on concrete and wash them down every day. They're still pigs. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter whether you don't, you aren't wearing the the yellow sweater and the and the burgundy pants with the snuff stains around your mouth, right? You're no better than she is. You're no better than anybody. Doesn't matter what kind of shoes you're wearing. You're no better than anybody else. All you are is a cleaner pig. That's all you are. You someone washed you down, but you're still the same creature. 
And so she, the, the, we as the reader get to see more. We see what's happening. It takes Ruby a lot of hard work to try to get through that. Once the African American workers on her farm begin to see her and give her the same kind of schmoozing that she's used to, all of a sudden she doesn't like that anymore. Oh, she's a nice lady. She's pretty too. She's oh, she should. She sure shouldn't have uh, said nothing ugly to you. You so sweet. You're the sweetest lady I know. She's pretty too and stout. <laughs> okay, well, I think that was one one too far. <laughs> <laughs> they may have laughed about that one. Oh, you called her stout because she's stout. Um, I never knowed no sweeter white lady. That's the truth before Jesus. I mean, for the first time, that kind of talk, that kind of laying it on thick flattery, she doesn't like it. Why? Because she knows it's not true. Deep down inside, she knows the truth. She knows that she's not right. She She knows the truth. She just doesn't like it. God's truth and our truth, or the way we perceive it or want it to be, don't always align. And the truth that she doesn't like is, we're all pigs, okay? Some of us are cleaner and have nicer floors, but pretty much we're all the same. And the fact of the matter is, if you go around thinking you're better than somebody else, well, don't be surprised if you don't get your comeuppance. And you don't like that. She doesn't like that. She never did like the fact that she's not able to see the world as this perfectly structured thing according to the way she thinks it should be structured. But the way she thinks the world should be structured and society should be structured and the way God does, two totally different things, right? And so she dismisses them as idiots, right? And so um, she says to God, she's angry. She says, what do you send me a message like that for? She said in a low, fierce voice, barely, how am I a hog and me both? How am I saved and from hell too? Well, but maybe we all are, right? How are we both a hog and a person? We have that potential, don't we, to be, to be both. We're both ugly and beautiful, her first, her free fist was knotted in the other one. She gripped the hose, po blindly pointing the stream of water in and out of the eye of the old sow whose outraged squeal she did not hear. Oh, folks, if you don't see the metaphor there, she's spraying the water into the eye of an old sow who's squealing, but she doesn't even hear it. What's just happened to her? She just got, you know, she just got a little discomfort in, in her own eye. And it doesn't feel too good. And she's squealing right now. So why me? It's no trash around here, black or white, that I haven't given to. And break my back to the bone every day working. And do for the church. How am I a hog? Exactly how am I like them? And she jabbed the stream of water at the shoats. There was plenty of trash there. It didn't have to be me. She probably does do a lot of good. There's nothing wrong. I mean, in other words, don't, don't go damning Ruby. Ruby's just like you and me. It's just that maybe some of the things that manifest themselves in her lives don't manifest themselves in ours, but we're just as much a hog as she is, right? There are other things. If, if you're not a racist, there's something else about you probably that you're not being very conscious of. How am I a hog? Exactly how am I like them? If you like trash better, go get yourself some trash then, she railed. You could have made me trash or a nigger. If trash is what you wanted, why didn't you make me trash? She shook her fist with the hose in it and a watery snake appeared momentarily in the air. I could quit working and take it easy and be filthy, she growled, lounged by the sidewalks all day drinking root beer, dip snuff, and spit in every puddle I have it all over my and have it all over my face. I could be nasty. Right? She braced herself for a final assault, and this time her voice rolled out over the pasture. Go on. Call me a hog. Call me a hog again from hell. Call me a warthog from hell. Put that bottom rail on top. There'll still be a top and a bottom. A final surge of fury shook her and roared, Who do you think you are? The color of everything, field and crimson sky, burned for a moment with a transparent intensity. The question rolled over the pasture and across the highway and the cotton field and returned to her clearly like an answer from beyond the wood. Who do you think you are? And it echoes back, Who do you think you are? Right? It's beautiful. She doesn't even have to tell you the echo. You just use it, use your imagination. And you think, yeah, it would echo back, wouldn't it? And it would ask her the same question she just asked God. And you know what? He doesn't need to answer it. You should answer that question. At, at last, she lifted her head. There was only a purple streak in the sky cutting through a field of crimson and leading like an extension of the highway into the descending dusk. 
She raised her hands from the side of the pen in a gesture hieratic and profound. A visionary light settled in her eyes. She saw the streak as a vast swinging bridge, extending upward from the earth through a field of living fire. Upon it a, a vast horde of souls were rumbling toward heaven. She's having a vision here at last. There were whole companies of white trash, clean for the first time in their lives, and bands of black niggers in white robes and battalions of freaks and lunatics shouting and clapping and leaping like frogs, and bringing up the end of the procession was a tribe of people whom she recognized at once as those who, as those who like herself and Claude, had always had a little of everything, and the God-given wit to use it right. She leaned forward to observe them closer. They were marching behind the others, with great dignity, accountable as they had always been for good order and common sense and respectable behavior. They alone were on key, yet she could see by their shocked and altered faces that even their virtues were being burned away. In a moment the vision faded, but she remained where she was, immobile. In other words, all the upper-class people, all the responsible people, the educated people, the people with money, the people with privilege, the people with the ability to do things, they're last. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Right? It's a very famous biblical scriptural line. You're in the back. But I'm the responsible one. All the more reason for you to be in the back. But I had a little of everything. Good. These had nothing. Get in the back. And she's shocked. The people in the back are shocked that they're in the rear, right? They're in the back of the bus, but they should be. Leadership, if you've been privileged, should lead you to moral awakening and enlightenment. That's what your job is. If you've been given a little of everything, if you've been given the authority and the power to make social change, and you don't, that's a flaw, friend. But if you're given that, use it. Use it properly, okay? Uh, don't forget the story's title. There's a vision. The vision is right here. That revelation is right here. At length, she got down and turned off the faucet and made her slow way on the darkening path to the house. In the woods around her, the invisible cricket choruses had struck up, but what she heard were the voices of the souls climbing upward into the starry field and shouting, Hallelujah. Faith, I think O'Connor is telling us, has to be put into action or it's dead. It's even harmful. Right? Look at the quotation that she's very famous for. Conviction, which means just being convinced of something, without experience, makes for harshness. That's a really profound thing to say. To be convinced of something that's true without having lived the truth of it, that can make you a very harsh and intolerant person. Once you've lived through something, you have the ability to say, mm, I should have a little grace about this. Um, I know what it's like. I know what it, I know what these folks are going through. I understand this because I lived it. If you, if you have strong beliefs without ever having experienced, having the experiences that bring those beliefs into reality for you, it can lead you to, to be a fairly harsh and intolerant person. We're going to continue our discussion online. One of the things I want to do is broaden this out a little bit and talk about American women writers, several of whom we've read, and their commitment to social change, because that is a really interesting thing that we've not brought too much up about. And with O'Connor, you certainly get that. So uh, tune in to um, uh, my email concerning the quiz and the discussion.